So today we continue our series of messages on thankfulness. There is always something for which we can be thankful. It is our month of Thanksgiving in November. And last week, uh, Pastor Joanne, who is actually covering for Pastor Alex at Morganland Union Church uh, today, uh, preached about all the saints. So we're thankful for those whose lives have influenced our lives, who have gone on to their eternal reward. And today, about when we are thankful, even when the circumstances can be difficult. So what are you thankful for? Well, I can tell you one of the things I'm thankful for is that I can use uh, my advance or my pointer once again. Okay, that's, I think this is, this is something. This is really something, and I really, I really love this. And it's, it's been out of commission when we were uh, doing the remodeling and the installation of the new organs, so I could actually uh, use this. Uh, many of you have a lot of reasons uh, you can be thankful. Maybe you have a new job, an addition to your family, new friendships. Maybe you've joined a new small group. Or maybe as 15 of you did two weeks ago, found a new church home here at Jordan. But for some people, it's a little more difficult to be thankful. How can you be thankful when maybe you have lost a job recently or your child is struggling with addiction or some other issues? Uh, maybe you have had a loved one die, someone very close to you. Your marriage is falling apart. How do you give thanks when life is tough? It's been a very challenging year for some people in our church. Instead of being thankful, you can feel depressed or dejected, disheartened. But throughout the Bible, God calls us to be thankful, to give thanks in all circumstances. 1 Thessalonians 5.18 says, make and uh, sing and make music from your heart to the Lord, always giving thanks to God the Father for everything, Ephesians I will praise the Lord at all times. I will constantly speak his praises. Psalm 34. We're still on uh, the, uh, daylight savings times, apparently, as the carillon's going on. That doesn't mean that the sermon comes to an end at this point, just to be clarified. I know some of you are thinking, hey, there's, there's the warning bell. So, no, that doesn't work that way. Uh, so, when is it that God calls us to give thanks only when things are going well, is that the time that we are to give thanks? No, God says that we are to give thanks at all times. So I'd like you to turn to someone near you or just say it to yourself. Um, and if you're on the live stream, maybe you want to put it in the chat. Say these words to someone near you. Give thanks in all circumstances. All right. We see that theme, and I want you to say that so that you remember that theme, because that theme is throughout all of Scripture, not just some isolated verse that we can point to in Leviticus and say, well, there it is, it's in the Bible. No, this is a theme throughout of Scripture. The prophet Habakkuk witnessed the destruction of Judah. He saw the Babylonians carry the people into exile, and he surveys this terrible damage. And what does he do? He gives thanks. Uh, in chapter 3, this is what he writes. Though the fig tree does not bud, and there are no grapes on the vines, though the olive crop fails and the fields produce no food, though there are no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, yet, yet, I will rejoice in the Lord. I will be joyful in the God, my Savior. Now, how does he do that? How does he do that when it seems like basically everything that he has looked around at is lost. Or consider the life of David. Early in his career, he's fleeing for his life. He's lost his family, his friends, his home. Out of jealousy, King Saul is trying to kill him. And so David hides in a cave all alone. And what does he do? He gives thanks. He writes in, uh, he wrote many of the Psalms, Psalm 57, 5, Be exalted, O God, above the heavens. Let your glory be over all of the earth. How does he do that when he is fleeing for his life? Or consider Paul, the apostle. At one point, he's put in jail just for preaching the gospel. And when he's there, he learns that his opponents are trying to take advantage of his situation and so while he's in prison, 
they will promote their own influence, which is contrary to the gospel that Paul is preaching at Paul's expense. But as he sits here thinking about his circumstances, what does he do? He writes to give thanks. He writes in Philippians 1, the important thing is that in every way, whether from false motives or true, Christ is preached. And because of this, I rejoice. Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. How does he do that? While he is in prison, he says that he will rejoice. So how can you give thanks when your loved one is sick, when your bills are piling up, when you can't find a job to sustain your family, when you're overwhelmed by life's demands? Can you give thanks in all circumstances? Now, sometimes people will say, and maybe you have said this as well, well, I'm thankful because I don't have it as bad as other people do. Have you ever said that? Uh, I've heard that a lot when people are in the hospital. Yes, uh, I'm, I'm not happy with things, uh, are, but I'm thankful because there are people who have cancer who will die from their cancer, and what I have can be, can be treated, just for example. Uh, there are people who are starving or sicker than me, uh, who don't have a home to live in, and all of that is, is true. It's good to put our life into a perspective of gratitude. It reminds us of all that we do have. But I don't think it's enough. I think we need to go deeper than that. Because when we're doing that, we're still concentrating on our own circumstances. We're, we're still thinking about ourselves. We're thankful that we have it better than others, but not necessarily uh, changing our circumstances. So here's the thing. Biblical thanksgiving is not based on circumstances. It's based on the conviction that God is a good God and God gives gifts to God's people. Thanksgiving, not just the holiday, but an attitude is a way of acknowledging God's goodness and to thank God for the gifts and more importantly, to thank God and acknowledge God as the giver of the gifts. Now, just in case you don't believe that you're already convinced about this message, I'm going to see if I want to test you now. Are you ready for a pop quiz? Let's see if you have heard this phrase before. God is good. All the time. All the time. Well, there you go. You've been saying that for a long time. I don't need to prompt you anymore. You already believe that it's true. That's what Thanksgiving is all about. It's not just when things, we don't say God is good because things are going well. It's just, it's my day, it's my week, it's my year. We are giving God thanks for being good all of the time. So I want to concentrate today on Romans 8, uh, the passage, one of the passages you'll find uh, in the text for today. Um, and I, 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 unfortunately, what I had to come up with my title and outline before I got into the depth. So I, I left off a couple of verses at the end of that chapter, but I'll be talking about those. Jonathan Edwards, who was a very influential preacher during the Great Awakening, uh, preached a sermon on this text, and, I, and I've adapted his three points today for, for today's message as well. I'd like to share uh, reasons that all of us can be thankful. So here they are. Challenges can turn out for good. Challenges can turn out for good. Secondly, the good you discover won't be taken from you. And then finally, I believe some of the best is yet to come. So let me just go over each one briefly. Uh, one of the reasons to be uh, thankful for is that uh, challenges can turn out for good. We've all faced challenges in our life. In verse 28 of Romans 8, we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him. I'm sure you've heard that verse before. It's one of the favorite verses uh, many people uh, will, will point to. And I, why is that? I think it's because it contains a special promise. The promise is not, I'll say what it's not, it's not that bad ever happened. If I were to say to people, 
All you need to do is believe in God. You will always have enough money. Uh, everything, but you'll never get sick. Um, you will have loads of friends. You have these pews would be there. Be a, there'd be a line waiting to come into the church every Sunday because it would be like an insurance policy. Nothing will ever go wrong in your life. As if you know, you you go to church, you pray, you do some things, and God owes you uh, a uh, a wonderful wonderful life. That's not biblical. And I know there are prosperity preachers that preach that. Uh, that's not the Bible. That's absolutely not the Bible. Jesus said, in this world, in, in, in the passage from the Gospel of John 16, in this world you will have trials, suffering, struggles, whatever it's translated. But remember, I have overcome the world. Sometimes we will have suffering, struggles, trials, temptations, but I think some of it's, we are surprised that we have to face these difficult challenges in our life. For goodness sake, I'm in church, I, I, I'm a, a faithful giver, I serve on a committee, I do all of these things. The promise isn't that bad things wouldn't happen. The promise is that God can take these things that happen and use them for good. A great example that I've used many times, one of my favorite biblical stories is a story of Joseph in the last third or so of the book of Genesis because it talks about family dysfunction better than just about any other place in scripture. He's the favorite son of Jacob. As you can imagine, sibling rivalry, his brothers are jealous of him, so they sell him into slavery, and then things just cascade from there. He's taken from his family. He's accused of rape. He's thrown into prison. Uh, Joseph experiences a betrayal, uh, and, uh, but he's a dreamer, remember? That's a, that's a thing he can interpret dreams. And so Pharaoh, he ends up in Egypt, and Pharaoh has a dream, and uh, interestingly enough, Joseph is able to interpret, accurately interpret that dream. He says, there's going to be a famine here. So he comes up with a plan, and he's given authority over the grain supply for the entire country. Eventually, the famine reaches Cana, where, his, where uh, Joseph's family still lives, and they come to Egypt looking for food. And there, Joseph provides them with food and the best land for them to live on. Because of everything that happened, he came in this position, he saves his family, and as the salvation, the story of salvation history interprets this story, he saves God's people. But when, his fa when their father dies, the brothers are terrified, and I've preached on this passage because they, it's about forgiveness, they're afraid of what he will now do to them because of what they did to him. But he says, what you intended for harm, God used for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives, Genesis 50, 20. Do you think that Joseph was happy about the circumstances? I doubt it. Do you think uh, that he deserved what he received from his brothers? Absolutely not. I don't think that God caused these things to happen. I don't think God delighted that these things happened, but God used them to advance divine purpose. It might not have worked out overnight, but it works out over time that God takes what is bad and makes it into good. And we have experienced that time and time and again in our life, and it's only in retrospect if we take time to reflect on our lives that we realize that has happened. I'll just give you one example from our church. September uh, 2019, we gathered in the social hall after the 1030 service around tables, members of our vision team and our consistory to talk about Vision 2020. At our table, uh, we were talking about why we don't live stream. Other churches live stream. Why aren't we doing that? At our table, someone said, we can't live stream. It's not possible. Uh, it'll cost thousands of dollars for equipment and for uh, the licensing fees. And we, we just will never be able to stream. Okay, that was 
That was uh, September of 2019. And then of all things, a global pandemic hit. And so we closed this church building on uh, Friday the 13th of March of 2020. And guess what happened on March 15th and that following Sunday? We were live streaming through Facebook with a million other churches on that first Sunday. It was a rough start. But since then, we have a, a live stream that reaches. I was just looking. There's someone from Shanghai, China watching today. The people who watch from India who join us virtually from India. A lot of our own members scattered, members and friends scattered. Uh, it has been a new tool of evangelism for what, what we thought was just the most terrible thing that could ever have happened to our church, that we would have the doors locked. God found a way to make for good. And I think we can thank God for that. You may be going through a rough time in your life right now, but you can still give thanks to God because with God, our challenges can turn out for the good. God may be working right at this moment in your life even if you don't see it. God works for good of all those who love God. And the second reason of, of the three reasons is that we can be thankful because we often discover things, good, good things, goodness that won't be taken from us. The late author Tim Keller, who was a pastor in a New York City church, wrote that God never promises better life circumstances, but God promises a better life. Better life circumstances are things like comfort and health and social status and success. Those are wonderful gifts from God. And if you have them in your life, you should be thankful. But that's not what God promises, all of those things. Rather, God promises a better life. And what does that look like? It looks a lot like Jesus. His life is a life of love. No matter how people annoyed or frustrated or attacked him, he was full of compassion and grace and forgiveness. His life looks a lot like what we hope for, we call peace. Didn't matter how much he had to do or what people expected, of him, he wasn't frantic or rushed. He was filled with joy and made time for prayer and for other people. Even when things got hard, he was betrayed, he suffered, he knew what he had to do. And nothing would stop him from living out his calling. We all know how Jesus lived his life, but do you know that that is the kind of life that Jesus is developing in all of us. In verse 29 of Romans 8, the Common English Bible, we know this because God knew them in advance, and he decided in advance that we, we, we should be conformed to the image of his son. That way, his son would be the first of many brothers or sisters. Conformed to the image of Jesus made more like his character. And if we open our hearts and our lives to be that, to be that transformed, that changed person, God will shape you more and more in the image of his son. That's not something that we do simply on our own. It is something that God does through us and gives us everything that we need. This is what 2 Peter has to say. Divine power has given us everything we need for a godly life through the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and goodness. Through these he has given us a very great and precious promise so that through them we may participate in the divine nature. To participate in the divine nature. That's the biblical promise. God is helping us to become the people that God intended us to be. The author of the hymn, Amazing Grace, John Newton, put it this way. Everything is necessary that he sends. Nothing can be necessary that he withholds. Now think about that. It means that right now you have everything that you need to do everything that God has called you to do in your life. 
We just haven't tapped the potential just yet. We're all in process. That's why we can be thankful, because the good things that we discover are things of God, and they will not be taken away from us. A final reason to be thankful is this. I believe the best is yet to come. Here is verse 30, the second half of Romans 8, verse 30. Those whom he called, he also made righteous. And those he made righteous, he also glorified. God's glory is one of the themes of Paul's letters. It comes up a lot when he is encouraging the early church that had to go through so very many hard times. In verse 18, he says, I consider that our present sufferings are not worthy to be compared to the glory that will be revealed in us. So in other words, if you are struggling, as long as you're focused on God's future glory, we can give thanks in today's circumstances, in all circumstances. Because as a Christian, we have God's forgiveness, God's grace, God's spirit inside of us. We have all these things now, and we can be thankful. And Paul says the best is yet to come, because there is a future glory awaiting each of us. And once we get that into perspective, then we can deal with just about anything that life throws our way. Like Paul says, it's like the mother who endures the pain of childbirth because she knows there's a baby coming. Or the athlete who trains his body because he knows or she knows that there is a prize waiting. I want to close with the words um, from a contemporary Christian song called Hallelujah Anyway. It's by Rend Collection. Just share some of the words. I find a way to praise you from the bottom of my broken heart because I think I'd rather strike a match than curse the dark. Yeah, I'll find a way to thank you though the bitterness is real and hard because I'd rather take a chance on hope than fall apart. I don't think I'm ready to surrender to the dark no, even if my daylight never dawns, even if my breakthrough never comes, even if I'll fight to bring you praise, even if my dreams fall to the ground, even if I'm lost, I know I'm found, even if my heart will somehow say, hallelujah, anyway. Yeah, I hear a hymn of triumph in the wilderness of my lament, in the lowlands or the mountaintops, I won't forget all of the goodness that you have shown me, the promise that you have kept. There's a better day on the horizon up ahead. Because even if my daylight never dawns, even if my breakthrough never comes, even if I'll fight to bring you praise, even if my dreams fall to the ground, even if I'm lost, I know I'm found, even if my heart will say, hallelujah, anyway. May it be so in your life and in mine. Amen.